Now we're dealing with a little bit broader idea, these principles of design, and many of these ideas apply to sculpture, architecture, etc. So these are sort of broader design ideas. And we're starting with repetition. This is the repeating or alternating of an item in an image, usually for rhythm, harmony, or variation. There are a lot of reasons to do this. For example, in this case with Marilyn Monroe, what Warhol is trying to do is show us the ubiquity or the, the way that her image surrounded people in the 1960s. He does the same thing with Coke bottles or uh, Campbell's soup cans, really getting at mass production and mass marketing. But it could be done to give you a sense of variation, uh, a sense of almost musical rhythm sometimes. Then we have balance, and balance is not the same as symmetry. So most pieces of art that you look at will not be symmetrical. But for balance, take the pieces of a painting. Take those individual forms, for example, trees, mountains, water, etc., and imagine that they're on either side of a balance. That will give you a sense of balance. And there's a lot of ways you can do this successfully. First, we have symmetrical balance. This is rare, but uh, you see it in logos and sort of geometric patterns, etc., where we have identical items on either side. So, of course, it's going to balance. Then we have a different form where you have balance because we have a larger item towards the middle and a smaller item towards one side. This is what we usually see from Bob Ross, where you would have a mountain close to the middle offset a little bit, and then a tree that's clearly smaller but providing balance to the piece. So by moving that larger item closer to the center, it allows for the smaller item to be further out. Then we can have two items which are similar in size but very different. For example, a house and a tree. Obviously, they aren't the same in any way, shape, or form, but as long as they're roughly the same size, it can balance. Finally, we can have a number of items on one side against one on another. So here we might have, say, a tree. And here we have a lot of small items that are building up on the other side. For example, you might have rocks in a stream, and they're much smaller than the tree on the other side, but there's a lot of them, so it does sort of balance the image out. And as humans, we like that sense of balance. It doesn't need to be symmetrical, but it does need to balance. So as an example, let's look at Starry Night. And of course, this is very famous. Uh, a very famous painting by Van Gogh. And if we take it apart, you'll notice that it does in fact balance. We have this massive tree here on one side. And you would think, wow, that's just a huge dark form. How's he going to deal with that? Well, what he does is we get a number of smaller items on the other side. So we have the moon, we have the hills, we have the town itself. We even have this swirl, all on the opposite side. The largest part, of course, is this swirl in the middle, and that swirl is there almost dead center, so it doesn't affect the balance. So we've got the tree versus the church and the town and the hills and the moon, etc., and it all works out. It all balances and looks attractive to us. If a piece doesn't balance, you will notice it subconsciously. You won't like it before you realize why you don't like it. Then we have focal area. So our eye tends to seek the area of the most visual appeal. And this spot that our eye is drawn to is known as the focal area. Artists will manipulate this in a number of different ways so that we look at something specific first. They want to move our eyes predictably around the drawing or painting so that we get the correct message out of it. In this case, if you're looking, this is The Last Supper, of course, 
And the thing that should draw your attention first should be the head of Jesus. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, first, we have confluence of, we'll be discussing confluence of line, then encirclement, then color, all of which are here in Leonardo's painting. So confluence of line, you remember implied line that we talked about a little while ago. This is the same thing. We're taking all of those implied lines and drawing them to a center point. If they all move to the same vanishing point like we see here, then our eye will be drawn to that point. You may not even realize that it's happening. Afterwards, you'll sit there and go, why was my eye drawn to that specific point in the painting? And often it will be this confluence of lines. So our eye will always seek out the vanishing point. Then we have encirclement. If I have one figure who is circled by a number of other figures, I will always pay attention to the figure in the center. Just like if you're in a club and people are dancing and, and you see a circle form, you always want to see what's in the middle of it. Or maybe in high school, you see a circle of students. You want to know what's going on in the middle. Same thing here. We always want to see what's in the middle. We're social creatures. We want to see what everyone's looking at, what everyone's paying attention to. The same thing that draws us to those circles in real life will draw us to the center of the circle in a painting. Finally, color. Although, let's be honest, in this example, the reason you're being drawn to the figure in the foreground is because it's a nude figure, and that usually catches most people's attention. But one of the other reasons you're being drawn to it is color. So this curtain in the background looks very, very dark, but has a greenish tone to it. Whereas our figure is painted primarily in sort of pink tones. Green and red, of course, are contrasting colors. So we're drawn to the point where those colors come together, where we have the most contrast, which exists right here along the figure. So we're automatically drawn to that point. The artist knows it. And then he knows that we're going to slowly move for a number of reasons that we'll deal with later in the class through the piece in a giant spiral ending up in this window. But we'll get to that in a little bit. So these ideas are used to draw our attention. The same thing happens with corporate logos uh, or could be used in a classroom or anywhere else when you want to draw someone's attention to a visual item. 